Welcome to the Surge Podcast. My name is Saud, and today we'll be continuing to talk about communicating in chaotic resuscitation. So the last time we talked about it, we went through the technical aspects, and I think, you know, I convinced about 50 to 60 percent of you, because I'm not very good at this yet, that, um, you know, chaotic environments are resuscitation environments, and resuscitation environments are by definition chaotic. And learning how to navigate that is extremely important. Today we'll be talking about how to get off that desert island where it's happening over and over again. How to motivate your team and what to look at. Now, um, anybody who knows me knows that I spend a fair amount of time doing one of two things outside of work. Netflix and video games. And the reason why I like video games is because it's, it's a sort of finite task that requires some mastery. Right, and it gives me a sense of achievement. I'll be honest with you. I think that personally, and, and there is some evidence sort of pointing there. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But my personal opinion is the metrics that you measure to measure patients' quality of outcomes should be linked in some way to metrics in the behavior, the communication, and the decision-making process involved within the individuals within the system such that you have an aggregate high score so let me say it again the outcomes that we measure typically as part of quality assurance programs such as nesquip and tquip should be linked in some way and i'm probably going to do an episode on this and just this to behaviors outcomes critical decisions made by individuals within the system. I think that as AI matures in healthcare, and as we get bigger and bigger data sets, we'll be able to create high scores that look at which human factors link up with which outcomes and can give you a compound score for your service and can actually compare your service to others. And there's a lot of data that proves that, that this is a very good motivator. Knowing how good you are compared to everybody else is a good motivator. That data comes from video games. And, you know, I think that that data motivates you in a way to begin to take a wide base of knowledge that we all have as physicians, nurses, healthcare practitioners, physiotherapists, pharmacists, uh, respiratory therapists. We all have an extremely wide knowledge base, right? Extremely wide whether it's technical skill as surgeons or it's um, statistical methods in research or it's the ability uh, to logically work through uh, a differential diagnosis at sort of lower residency, higher medical student level, that, that intellect, that, that font of knowledge, that big footprint of knowledge, right? is there. But at any given time during a high stress resuscitation situation, the skill set that you manifest is very finite. And I think that a high score, I'm going to try and convince you of this today with some evidence, a high score, an aggregate system scoring and assessing somebody, motivates them into incorporating more of that wide base of knowledge into their skill set. So that the both books, the one on the left and one on the right, look exactly the same after a couple of years. And the closer you get to them looking the same, the greater your level of mastery. You know, if I, if I was to summarize my personal voodoo, non-evidence-based theory of how resuscitation works, that would be it. You build a huge knowledge, knowledge base. You begin to access it in high-stress situations as a junior resident. You access more and more of it at any given time in parallel until you can access an extremely wide gamut of skills in a very finite amount of time, and you can change all four tires from our last episode in a minute instead of 45 minutes. Now, uh, I've just used three different paradigms to explain the same thing and made things even more confusing. Point is, you want to be able to access everything within your knowledge base at equal speed, eventually. It's not going to happen today, but there are ways to motivate you. 
and one of them is certainly a high score. And the more that you can access when you're playing video games, the higher your high score is. That's a cognitive load problem. It's actually been studied. So when we're evaluating communication, when we're trying to form a high score, there are a number of different approaches that the literature tends to support. The first is debriefing. And that's the most important. Debriefing helps out significantly. I can't tell you the number of times that I've shown up after codes specifically to attend debriefs, even if I wasn't at the code, just because I feel that I learned from those. And I, I try and coach the trauma team leaders to do good debriefs. Sometimes I'll talk to them offline between me and them. Sometimes I'll be there myself, but I try my best to make sure that my colleagues do a debrief. The second one is, is, is to provide some sort of evaluation, some summative evaluation. Typically, our residents at the institution I work in right now, they spend about a month with us on a vertically integrated trauma service. We take care of the patient from when they come into when they leave. And I try to give them some sort of evaluation. Now, I'll probably do a whole episode on how to evaluate people, in my opinion at least, based on the literature. But, you know, I think that time spent evaluating after the first week, then the second week, then the third, is extremely fruitful. I've seen a lot of residents develop very good skills, and I've seen it being used as a litmus test. If they can't take the feedback, and they can't recognize the work that needs to be done, that's unfortunately a litmus test sometimes, right? And also, of course, there's one-on-one -on -one one -on -one time with expertise. So I, I try to make sure that if somebody's interested in, in a specific part of trauma, for example, orthopedics, they spend a significant amount of time with the orthopedics attendings in the operating room. I've had two or three candidates do that. And then you need to recognize that evaluating communication is a dynamic process. You're never going to get consistent communication skills. They're going to wax and wane, and they're going to change based on context. And we kind of touched on it last episode when we talked about behavior and thought process and intent and how the behavior and the thought process need to align to produce the correct intent. Now, you would think that um, this type of thing only happens in medicine, but it doesn't. So in, in, in industry, this is called crew resource management. And this is one of the, uh, I would think one of the best articles to read on crew resource management, generic team building, right? And there's a lot of like uh, what we call organizational psychology involved with it. Uh, certainly a lot of um, psychometrics that have been tried to be used. And it's, it's really, a, it's a field that's relatively young, right? And it's probably going to grow significantly. And the reason why I point out this article is because it talks about how to develop a scoring system for your group and where things take time and how much time you should dedicate to scoring. When you look at it, for every two hours of training that you spend, right, you should spend at minimum 45 minutes of communication training and 60 minutes of feedback with 15 minutes of testing. So again, I, I, I'm, I'm going to repeat this. In their study, they analyzed and built a lab-based study so this is a controlled study, right? To look at how to address the concern of errors in crew resource management, errors in team dynamics. And what they found was you should spend 120 minutes teaching, doing technical training, and then 45 minutes doing pure communication training, followed by competence training for 15 minutes, testing for 60, and then 30 minutes of feedback with debriefing for 10. So if you take debriefing, feedback, and communication and put them together, it's almost, it isn't the same, I agree with you, but it's almost the same as the amount of time that you spend doing giving didactic teaching, the equivalent of our ATLS. So in theory, the same amount of time that we dedicate towards ATLS should be dedicated towards communication training. And what they found was when you compared the two teams, the transition towards congruent teams and towards efficient teams 
was exponentially quicker. When I say exponential, I mean like by factors, like by a factor of four or five quicker in teams that received some sort of crew resource management training, teams that were taught how to communicate effectively. That's what it really is. And this data has been replicated in flight crews, in surgery ORs, including bariatrics and elective surgeries like that, in anesthesia, who were the first to provide dedicated simulation training. Not dedicated communication training, but simulation training towards that goal. ER, and emergency medicine, intensive care medicine and critical care, and trauma. In trauma, we tend to use the scores as motivators these days. And, you know, uh, this is another good study. It's open access. Uh, that talks about um, the effect of telling people where they stand effectively <laughs> and how, how that can help them. And, you know, uh, tradition thought processes in, in modern education would say you should never um, or you should curtail the amount of negative feedback that you give and you should give 80% positive feedback. Uh, this data is extrapolated uh, from uh, workplace psychology studies from back in the 80s. And some of it is true. I do agree with a significant amount of positive feedback of a certain nature that was defined back then. right? But what this study shows, which is extremely interesting, is that if you take five teams and you tell each team where they are compared to the rest of the group while anonymizing the rest of the group, are they first, second, third, fourth, or fifth? In different parts of the skill set, they will be motivated to continue to improve. In other words, expressing a team's rank, not necessarily the individual, but the team's rank, is an independent motivator towards success and gets you over the curve quicker. Now, this was a very small study. It only involved five teams. But for an education study, I think that you'll all agree, it's more than food for thought. It's pretty definitive. Because most educational studies can't involve huge sample sizes. Most behavioral studies have to be curtailed and controlled, so the sample size will have to be low. right? Now, a lot of this data went into uh, developing uh, the uh, START course, which is a dedicated course towards the development of crew resource management and where it fits into trauma specifically, right? And this was the TAC 2013 plenary paper. I was fortunate enough to be there. Uh, I was presenting a far more mediocre paper back then. Uh, we're not going to talk about it today or possibly ever. Um, but in their paper, they outlined what they felt was an evidence-based approach. And, you know, I have to hand it... Uh, to Lawrence Gilman, Paula Fata, and the rest of the gang, because they did a phenomenal job at, at providing the groundwork for what we now know, seven years later, is a critical part of our training, uh, both in trauma and in resuscitation in general. And they felt that the areas that needed to be covered were uh, the history of crew resource management, leadership skills, teamwork and communication, situational awareness, trauma team organization, trauma resuscitation and damage control resuscitation. And there is a difference between the two. And maybe I'll do a, a, a separate talk specifically looking at resuscitation principles in general or shock in general, and then going down to different types of, I don't like to call them different types of shock because I don't believe in different types of shock, but different paradigms of thought towards shock. And if you go to the course, they give you this great book. I would thoroughly recommend that you buy the book if you're not going to the course. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal book. Um, it, it's great because it does what it's supposed to do, and it does it very well, in that it explains, it begins by giving you that wide base, and then it focuses in on specific things that you need to know. And in fact, I, I would even contend that if you bought the book, and if you read the book, and then you went to the course, your ability to translate that to something that you use in your institution is far higher. But that's just, you know, my feeling. In addition to that, similar uh, concepts that they used to grade at start have been translated to something called CATS, which is the Communication Teamwork Skills, 
in performance. And they compared it to different other scoring systems that are used both in nursing and in the operating room. And this is the uh, CATS uh, scoring uh, system. And looking at it, they found that even in bariatric surgery, there was some validation to it. Now, they did this using dry run videos, but this tells you that the skills that you teach your surgeons and anesthetists and nurses in the trauma bay as part of their training translate directly to operating room performance. This isn't very significant if you label yourself as an emergency doctor or a critical care physician, but for somebody like me, it is a little bit important, especially considering that in certain places and certain centers, surgeons are actually responsible for both their elective surgical practice and their emergency practice on any given day, including a trauma practice. So it, it is a little bit significant that there's some cross-pollination in the skill set. Again, I can't say enough good things about START. I think it's a great step forward. I think that everybody should buy the book. Um, also, uh, if you look at Peter Brindley, who's one of the authors there, and Murad Hamid, they both wrote excellent, excellent papers, as well as Paula Fata. Excellent papers, not just in trauma or in critical care, but in human factors. And I think, you know, it's phenomenal what these guys write. And the gist of it is, when I went to that course, some of the things that I took there from there was that you need to be clear in your organization, right? This is one of the first things that I learned going to that course. I couldn't just, and, and you know, it's a course that, that seems to be mainly geared towards nursing for some reason. I, I, at least my group had a lot more nurses than doctors there. I'm just going to be honest. But the course itself is geared towards organization. So one of the first things that I did in our institution here in Kuwait was I set up these posters over every single bed in the trauma bay. And I put them into our booklets so that everybody knew where they had to stand and everybody knew what their roles would be. Now, MD1 and MD2 are basically your two residents. TTL is the trauma team leader, the two instrument trays, and the nurses are thunderbolts because I have a huge problem in the Middle East in terms of empowering nurses. So I wanted to give them a position of strength, being part of the team and being part of the resuscitation and being looked at as literally thunderbolts because some of them are extremely slick. And, you know, I really, I really do think that the future is in training your nurses to reach a level of proficiency here, especially in the Middle East, and where the ICU doctor sits for the airway adjustment, and, of course, where the ultrasound machine should be. Let's not forget, the ultrasound machine is now part of the team. As far as I'm concerned, one of the biggest changes to our emergency room was that surgeons start to do fast ultrasounds. It's an extremely, extremely, extremely useful thing. And in addition to that, I made it very clear on the poster that you should communicate with your trauma team leader. Everything goes to your trauma team leader. Communication is just as important as positioning. Positioning is just as important as activation. It's not an activation unless you communicate. And that's also what I tell them during our uh, orientation. In addition to that, another thing that I learned from that course was that you need to define the things that will kill a patient if they're not addressed directly by a whole team. So if your emergency doctor thinks that a patient needs airway management, the whole team should go down there if it's a trauma. If the GCS is below 8, this patient's not going to go home. They're going to go to the ICU. Systolic less than 90, they're going to go to the ICU. Mangled extremity, they're not going to go home. They need to be seen by us and anesthesia in the ICU. If they have a history of paralysis, they're not going to go home either. You get the point. So there have to be clearly set up criteria that allow or empower your emergency department to call you before it becomes a chaotic situation for them, before their stress level is too high. Because, like I said in the previous episode, our business is this chaos. Our business is this stress. We're paid well, and we're trained well, and we spend hours training, and we're very passionate about this type of patient. In other places, they're not. In other disciplines, they may not be. Not all emergency doctors have a particular love of resuscitation for trauma. Some of them who are extremely good resuscitationists, and I've heard them even in their own podcast say, they're not particularly interested in trauma. So not all of them love trauma. 
but I think that it's extremely important and extremely fruitful for you to tell them which cases they can just call you for right off the bat. And that's what we did as well. We also have dedicated training days. Now, these aren't teaching days. These aren't teaching happens on a daily basis. It's about 20 to 30 minutes. These are dedicated days where we go through simulation dry runs. We sit around a table and it's Sundays and Wednesdays for the doctors, Tuesdays for the nurses. Hopefully very soon I'll be able to have them all together in one session, maybe have three sessions a week, which I would love. And we go through one scenario and what every person's role is going to be in that scenario. And we do that with the same people who are on the shift with you. Now, I'm starting to get the nurse's schedule synchronized with the doctors. That took a lot of headache. But once I do get that done, I'm hoping to get the nurses and the doctors for these dry runs, right? And in the beginning, these dry runs were designed for us to know whether or not to intubate, whether or not to put in a chest tube, whether or not to put in a central line, the things that you would expect them to have to learn to make a decision on. They were primarily clinical decision-making tools. They were designed to train them for clinical decision making. That's how it started on the first week of their rotation. By the third week of their rotation, I make sure that the trauma team leader or the person who I assigned as the team leader during these dry runs, and sometimes it, it's very hard to do, not only tells you what they want to do, such as the airway, but assigns the task to a particular person and demonstrates how they're going to communicate it. And the other person has to reciprocate and demonstrate what they're going to do, describe it, and then feed it back. As we got better at this, uh, the time came where we actually needed to begin to run quote-unquote real simulations. Because the, no matter how good the data is for dry runs, the data for simulations far better. And so, you know, I looked online and I decided that for me to be able to t train a team leader, a recorder, a runner, an airway, an RT, a bedside RN, and a pharmacist, when I eventually get my pharmacist, I'm going to need to begin to do real, quote-unquote, simulations. Now, when you look at most simulators, the Lyrdal ones at least, they're in the tens of thousands. And I, I don't have the tens of thousands. This is a very young trauma program. It's barely been around for two years. We've seen 9,000 patients in two years, but it's barely been around for two years. So, you know, I'm a bit, money's not there. So I looked online and I found two different things. First, Amazon's awesome and that you can get a CPR trainer, a mannequin, with an AED and an actual real AED that you can shock somebody with if you really wanted to. And you can download an app called Simmon. And what that app does is that it lets you hook up your iPhone to your iPad and use your iPad as a cardiac monitor. You can even use your iPhone as a cardiac monitor potentially, but you can use your iPad. It's about $22. So for the cost of $140, I have a simulation lab. Is it the best simulation lab in the world? No. Uh, is it high fidelity? No. But I have the clinical data on the TV through a connection to the actual iPad. I have a cardiac monitor in the iPad itself. And I have a mannequin where I can train people to bag mask ventilate, put a Goodell airway, attempt an intubation, put cardiac monitors on if and when I want to. May not be able to establish IV access on it, I do agree with you, but at least it's a start. And for $140, that's not quite bad, to be honest. And we've had some very good feedback from our residents on this. So quick tip, get the Preston Medical from Amazon and get your Simmon on, and that's your simulation center. If you really want to improve communication, it doesn't happen overnight. You're going to have to do this three days a week. And yes, I can tell you right now, some days it's very painful, especially if you've had a very long weekend. When I score the simulations, I don't use something as, as complex as what I showed you earlier. I tend to just score them on a Likert score of 1 to 5 on clinical leadership, followership. And it's very culture dependent. You know, ideally, I would have liked to get the nurses involved earlier. But culturally, there are certain barriers to it. And you want to concentrate on developing their confidence first, both the doctors and the nurses. 
especially because, like I said, it's a very new program. But I think that that's contextually something that you're going to have to do. You're going to have to respect the local culture first. In summary, the clinical aspect of resuscitation, the communication aspect are equally important, especially in high-stress situations where you, which you deem chaotic. Remember, do not fear the chaos. You're used to it. Develop an equilibrium with it. Make it par part and parcel of your training. Learn to be a good leader and a good follower. Establish certain ground rules, certain minimum requirements that you expect for your team. And then establish a scoring system. And practice, practice, and practice. This is Saud Al Zaid. Thank you for listening and thank you for the support. Please feel free to subscribe. You can get me on YouTube, Google Play, Podcasts, and Instagram. All you have to do is scan the QR code. And um, yeah. Don't forget to subscribe and feel free to give me any feedback.